when I joined the Air Force, there was a, a world war underway uh, very shortly, you know, when the Japs came into the war. And uh, honestly, I didn't expect to survive. I finished 75 missions with 75 Squadron. When I first joined 75 Squadron, I was based at Goodenough Island up in the eastern end of New Guinea. Uh, actually, I flew up there on my 21st birthday. Goodenough Island had quite a good airstrip uh, right along the beach there. It was uh, graded coral. Not very good living conditions. Uh, we um, were living in tents. Quite often there's torrential downpours of rain and that's not all that good and uh, quite often there's water runs through your tent and things like that. And um, of course mosquitoes is another hazard. We lived on meat and vegetable rations and uh, bully beef. Uh, not the best, uh, but still it was adequate, but uh, by and large fairly rough stuff. They varied a lot, the flying conditions in New Guinea. Um, it wasn't advisable to fly into a cloud because uh, you, uh, there might be a mountain in the middle of it. Quite often they have cloud all around the upper areas of them. To my way of thinking and from my experience, the Kitty Hawk was probably the best uh, fighter we had available uh, in the Pacific area there until the Mustang came along. It, the Kitty Hawk was um, a very tough aeroplane that would take a lot of punishment and, uh, and still get you back. It had the strongest wing of any World War II fighter. Uh, it had, in memory, I think about five main spars in the wings. Uh, you just couldn't break it. And um, uh, a fair, fairly reliable motor. Very seldom did anybody um, <clears throat> really get into strife there. The ground crew, the two chaps on my um, aeroplane, were, um, they were absolutely marvellous. Of course, they had to sit underneath the wing of the aeroplane out of the sun for most of the day. But when uh, we got a, a call to scramble and the siren went, they'd, the Kitty Hawk didn't have a self-starter, so they had to uh, start winding it up with this big handle. And uh, so they'd jump up and start winding. And by the time I got to the aeroplane and strapped on my parachute, uh, they'd call out contact and uh, I'd get the motor going. God help it, me if, if, if I didn't get it going first time because they got a bit crooked about that. But um, um, they did a wonderful job and um, I always appreciated that. Kitty Hawk uh, was a fairly aer easy aeroplane to fly really but um, they maintained it perfectly. We um, went over to New Britain for a while and uh, covered most of New Britain. Uh, troop movements, uh, barges which they tried to hide up creeks and things like that but uh, if we could find any of them well we strafed them and uh, a Kitty Hawk with uh, 6.5 machine guns can do a hell of a lot of damage. On one occasion we uh, came across a um, fairly big vessel that had an estimated five or six hundred troops on board and uh, I'm afraid um, they came to grief. In a strafing attack you uh, usually open fire um, at about um, 250, 300 yards. You've got to remember that you're doing probably 250, 300 miles an hour and you're only going to get a very brief few seconds in which you can, uh, you can fire before you have to pull out. You don't want to hit the ground and it did happen. Once or twice people held their, their fire just a little too long and, uh, and crashed and we didn't want to lose anybody. We moved up from, uh, <coughs> where from, from Cape Gloucester, I think, with three squadrons of Kitty Hawks just after they'd captured it. And um, they, the um, Australian number no. two um, aerodrome construction squadron moved in with their little bulldozers and filled in all the bomb craters and so on and um, uh, laid down this uh, steel matting 
for us and uh, when we arrived uh, one uh, pilot was detailed to go down and, um, and land and uh, act as control and uh, he went down and of course naturally enough tried to touch down right at the beginning of the runway but what he didn't know was that there was a bit of a bump there and he hit this bump and flipped over. He wasn't badly injured and uh, there were some soldiers and that around there and they um, uh, lifted up the tailplane and let him get out and he acted as a control officer then warned us that not to touch down. Uh, too close to the beginning of the runway because of this bump. I got hit a number of times actually and um, the only detriment to me was when the, my ground crew went crooked at me. They used to really uh, go crooked, you know. God's sake, Blue, can't you look after our aeroplane better than that? God, think we've got nothing to do but mend the damn thing? For God's sake, be more careful. But of course they were just glad to see me back in one piece. There was a friend of mine who came up right at the end. In fact, he came up to replace me when uh, my tour was up. And um, Morrie Barden was his name. And poor old Morrie uh, uh, took over my aeroplane and um, went out on his first job and never came back. So uh, that was very sad. His wife, she was advised that he was missing in action. Unfortunately, I had to tell her that there was no hope. But uh, those things happen and uh, in wartime and uh, it's inevitable and you just have to learn to deal with it.